you ask me to write my life. I cannot write my life for I have forgotten much of my talk as well as the talk of the Arabs. O oh brother, in the name of Allah, I ask you not to blame me for my eye is weak as well as my body. Omar Ibn Said was a famous and a scholarly African-American Muslim uh, who came here in the early 1800s. But Omar Ibn Said's uh, manuscript shows that he was a scholar. He was a world's traveler before he was even captured and enslaved. It is the only known uh, existing manuscript in Arabic written by a slave. And it's written by a man who is still a slave. He arrived when he was 37. He died, he was over 80. Over a period of 40 years, he knew English. In Arabic, he knew that no one could understand what he said. And therefore, he could be more truthful, if you want, less fearful. The fact that these materials are written in Arabic sort of changes what we believe we know about American slavery and about those individuals who were enslaved in America. In a typical classroom, when students are introduced to American slavery, there is a section in their textbook, and that section in their textbook may or may not introduce many details about specific individuals. So I think part of what this collection does is it lends an original voice that we've never heard before to a story that we thought we knew. It opens a window into 200 years ago. What was West Africa like? Who were the people who were on that continent? So we begin asking new questions. The questions of, about the lives of those slaves before they became slaves. My name is Umar ibn Said. My birthplace, Futa, between the two rivers. He was born in an area which was between um, two rivers, probably what is Senegal today. And there he grows up and he studies. So he says, I spent 26 years studying. And you say, okay, what was he studying? He doesn't elaborate. One has to assume that he went beyond reading and writing to doing much more. And then they came to our country, a big army. It killed many people. It took me and walked me to the big sea and sold me in the hand of a Christian man. There was tribal warfare in the region and um, he is caught. And then he is sold into slavery. He is sold to merchants who were buying slaves. And he is then put on a ship and he sails for six weeks. He also uh, uh, talked about his experience when he arrived here, uh, uh, making it into what he called Charlestown, uh, uh, and being badgered and uh, misused and abused to the point that he had to uh, escape. So they captured him and they put him in jail. And so he stays there and He's alone in, in a room and he begins writing on the wall. He begins writing and he writes in Arabic because that's a language he knew. He could not understand what people were saying around him. And they was curious about this guy, you know, they wrote this writing. They thought that um, the Africans had no culture, no history, couldn't read and write. Omar Ibn Said dispels that. He could read, he could write. And he was very scholarly. On Friday, a man came and opened the door of the jail, and I saw many men whose language was Christian. They called to me, Is your name not Omar? Is it not Said? I did not understand the Christian language. He refers to them as um, uh, the Owens, and they are, one of them turns out to be the governor of North Carolina. And he takes him in, and then he says that there were good men who uh, believed in God, who had a Bible, and who read to him the Bible. 
anywhere from 25 to 28 percent of the population that was brought here were Muslims. The same prophets that we find in the Quran, we find in the Bible. So he was able to intertwine, interrelate those experiences. But when he writes his biography, he begins with a verse from the Quran. And the verse from the Quran is again a very interesting choice. It is the verse which refers to domination, which refers to ownership, Surat al-Mulk. And in Islam, all ownership belongs to God. God is the only owner. It can be understood as a criticism of the whole institution of slavery. And he does this in the subtle way of saying, you really have no right to own another human being. They robbed their culture, they robbed their identity, they uh, disconnected them from family, uh, there was no connection. They reside in our country because of the great harm. The infidels took me in justly and sold me. It's one of those stories that will always be relevant. Um, today, around the world, there are tens of millions of people who are enslaved. So, Omar Ibn Said humanizes the experience of a person in his own words. If this is a voice we've never heard of before, and these materials have been out there, what other materials exist? What other stories can we help uncover? And how can those stories together help us better understand an episode of our nation's past that maybe we don't understand as thoroughly as we ought to? There's a lot of insight that can be pulled out of it if they, people take it not with bigotry in their heart or, or arrogance in their heart, but to look for the insight. You see in concrete, you know, grass come up out of concrete or, or trees grow up out of concrete. So out of the concrete of enslavement, you find positive Muslim personalities rising out. Things will get better, things will be better, and that's what they represent. Hope that things will get better. The manuscript of Omar bin Said signifies the spread of knowledge about the African Muslim community, specifically as it relates to the American slave trade, religion, and race relations. The other aspect of the library's collection is the African Islamic Manuscript Collection, a series containing such documents as the visionary religious Arabic manuscripts of Sheikh Sanasi, a mystical account of the creation of the world and of mankind by Muhammad Dakur, and various translations of the Omar bin Said narrative. The attainment and dissemination of all of these required years of correspondence between significant missionaries, ethnographers, historians, and scholarly specialists. At the core of this company was Theodore Dwight, a New Yorker, abolitionist, and founding member of the American Ethnological Society, who campaigned for a better understanding and appreciation of African Islamic culture. He was interested in introducing um, African culture to this country um, so people will understand better you know the the background of the African people and not just seeing them as slaves um, so he collected a number of important um, manuscripts written by um, the slaves of his time and through the help of various people including um, two presidents of Liberia. So, you know, therefore we have now a collection of 42 items and every each one is unique uh, in its own way. Long before each of Dwight's pieces could find a permanent place in the archives, the individual documents passed through dozens of hands. An extensive and interconnected chain of acquisition brought the collection to its current home. Beginning with Theodore Dwight, the manuscripts first went to David Bliss, a notable missionary, founder of the prestigious American University of Beirut, and fellow founding member of AES. Shortly after the documents were returned to Dwight, they passed through the offices of the first and second presidents of Liberia, Joseph Jenkins Roberts and Stephen Allen Benson, respectively. After the documents were given back once again, they were studied by numismatist Howland Wood, likely from his home state of Massachusetts. The collection was then given to Dr. F. M. Musa and Isaac Byrd in order to be translated from Arabic into English. 
After quite a number of years with them, the papers went to accomplished historian John Franklin Jameson in Washington, D.C. The last known individual to have the Omar ibn Said manuscript was Derek Beard, a philanthropist and art collector based in California. This process of analyzing, translating, and simply appreciating the collection created a comprehensive web of people, all dedicated to scholarly integrity and sharing knowledge. Finally, in 2002, the full collection began its journey to the library. The original owner, uh, Derek Beard, uh, was an art collector, um, and he um, first displayed the Omar ibn Said uh, manuscript here at the library in 2002 at a symposium. So when the materials were made available at Sotheby's, the library uh, decided to acquire them and use library funding uh, to acquire those manuscripts in 2017. When broken down, the library's basic acquisition process is really only five steps. Identification, approval and funding, exchange and partnerships, copyright deposit, and purchase. But it's not actually so straightforward. It sounds like a very simple thing to say, but this is actually a very um, uh, pretty big project involving a lot of different offices um, collaborating together over a period of time uh, in order to achieve that goal of eventually presenting the collection online to the general public, to anyone who is interested in, in looking at While the mechanism and the infrastructure for how we make it happen may have changed, the purpose behind it is the same. Mm -hmm. Building the collection, um, building up the relationship, and you do that through communication. And that communication means improves with each generation and technology improvements. The library is a research institution, meaning like we have, you know, uh, millions and millions of materials that are available for scholars, but we also have these materials for um, education purposes. So teachers will be able to come in and use the Omar Bin Said collection for their classroom. They can use these, this collection, design um, a class, a history class. Um, scholars can come in, look at these materials from a different perspective and write their scholarly papers or publications. So, and the general public can just come and look at the collection and just simply learn more about the history of, the, of this country, about slavery. Um, yeah, so, you know, definitely the collection is uh, of great value to, you know, to our people, not just now, it, it's also important for generations to come. So, what has happened is, this is just one set of documents that's added to that research, uh, that rich research field for anyone to explore. And it also helps establish um, either boundaries or it helps break down boundaries among those disciplines to say that they really are not that separate. They all begin to meld. And the beauty of having uh, access to a broad array of content is that it allows the research of the scholar, the student, to be able to pull these pieces together and see how they do over that, how they intertwine, how they meld, and while how there is likely no real strong line of demarcation uh, among all of these disciplines. Well, you have to think about it. If Theodore Dwight did not put an emphasis on this collection, on this manuscript. If he did not correspond with others, this manuscript may not have survived. It was his effort to retain, to keep this manuscript, to bring in other scholars to write about, to translate, to communicate, and to retain this collection that made it possible for the manuscript in a way to survive. And so, as you see, there are the creators, the one who has actually written the manuscript, Omar bin Said, and then there are the enablers who enable those materials to be made uh, uh, public. And the Library of Congress is doing the same thing by creating a website, by making these materials available. 
we enable the learning process about the society, about Omar bin Said. Before an artifact can go on display, it must go through a lengthy conservation process that ensures the artifacts can be enjoyed for generations to come. Before anything can happen, the departments involved in preservation and presentation get together and decide which artifacts are the top of their priorities and how feasible each project is. After an artifact is given the green light, it heads to conservation where it undergoes intense inspection and repair. Shelley Smith, head of book conservation at the Library of Congress, and Sylvia Albro, senior paper conservator, talk to us about the conservation process. Broadly, uh, we treat um, uh, the, the, the collections of the Library of Congress. We make sure that they are um, uh, well cared for, uh, that they are stored and housed properly, um, that they can be accessed and, um, and used by researchers and scholars and visitors. The conservators told us about how they get to interact with artifacts in unique ways in order to learn more about the historical context of the documents. Well, because I, I think that items have layers of stories to tell. And there's their immediate appearance, there's what's written in the text in the case of a manuscript, but there's also what it's composed of, how it was designed, how it was put together. It all means something, and so you can tell a different story with the technical information than necessarily what's written in the text. Looking at the Omar ibn Said documents, the conservators were able to analyze the paper that allowed them to make predictions about the origins of the document. The original autobiography was written with iron gall ink. This ink is known for its rich color and durability. It's created by a chemical reaction between tannic acid and iron sulfate. This causes the tannic acid to produce a dark color when exposed to oxygen. Tannic acid is found in galls, which are growths on an oak tree in response to parasites. To extract the acid, the galls are crushed, boiled, or chemically fermented using mold. The fermentation method will result in the blackest ink, but takes the longest. Because of the acidic nature, the ink is known to be fairly corrosive over time and prone to color changes. The conservators found the ink had not corroded much of the paper, so it was likely of a very high quality. We try as much as possible in conservation to be sure that what we do doesn't inalterably change something. But it's, sometimes. but it's, it's, it, it. Sometimes it is necessary, and to attempt a treatment procedure that has the potential, there's always a chance that something could unexpected could happen, and it involves a fair amount of guts to be able to go through and and say, you know, test and test and test, but then put a piece of paper in a bath of water. You just have to jump in. The conservators have to be very careful when interacting with the documents. They made it clear that their purpose is to make the documents as accessible as possible while maintaining its integrity. After conservation has finished their work on the artifacts, they are sent to the digitization lab where they are photographed and prepared to be put online. We are responsible for digitizing items from the cultural heritage collections um, to make them available online so that people around the world can see them. The lab has a variety of equipment in order to present the artifacts with the best lighting and most accurate quality available. Their equipment ensures that the files accessible online are accurate and replicating what the documents may be like in person. New color checker, because our job is to capture items at true to color form. Color accuracy, accuracy is very important. So each color swatch here has an aim point, which is a number value that we strive to set up the camera toward. Similar to conservation, the lab has to be very careful not to damage any documents, so they use special machinery to handle them and get the best picture possible. This is the rare book modulator, which is a special scanner that holds pages flat, pressed against the glass, but the table underneath the glass moves in such a precise manner that the glass is able to apply little to no pressure on the book itself, reducing any damage. The Omar ibn Said documents were so old that the digitization process had to take place inside the conservation lab to avoid any damage. The library works to ensure that all artifacts remain intact so that they're accessible to scholars and the general public. A lot of scholars and researchers 
Some, a lot can't come here to the library, and we have a lot of things here, one-of-a-kind things, um, that uh, given sometimes the fragility of an item determines whether it can be served to the public or not. After digitization, the artifacts are posted online for scholars and the general public to view. The library uses a technique called metadata to attach keywords to various artifacts so that anyone can search for a topic on the library's website. So some of the things that we've handled in the past are top treasure items here at the library, such as documents that created the U.S., for example, which would entail uh, the rough draft of the Declaration of Independence, um, Gettysburg Address, and, and so on. To bring out something that's so iconic and see people's reaction to it and see them interact with history. Um, and there's something that's so immediate and, um, and intimate um, about a person um, seeing uh, a, a document that is so much a part of our American life. No matter whether it's the Declaration of Independence or the Omar Ibn Said manuscripts, the Library of Congress is filled with artifacts that are each a piece in the puzzle of America's rich history. Today you saw an inside look at the process through which these artifacts are preserved for scholars, researchers, and the general public for generations to come.